Okay, so let's have a class. And uh, we already talked about the uh, fluid mosaic model of the cell membrane. And this slide, which is, tells you the function of the cell membrane, and uh, uh, cell synthesis, energy metabolism, DNA replication, uh, sensation of the stimuli. We will be spending a lot of time talking about molecular transport. Uh, that is important here and will be a little bit different compared to what you already learned in the biology and even biochemistry class. So what we are here to talk about is uptake of nutrients. This is specifically here, we'll be using the example is a bacteria. And uh, first thing first, everybody knows there are three major nutri nutrition transport methods. The number one is called passive diffusion. So passive diffusion, we <coughs> learned in your biology class, it is from high concentration transferred to low concentration. I mean the solvents, or we say nutrients. There is no energy requirements, which means no ATP, hydrolyze, become ADP, and release phosphates. And they do not need a carrier. And this carrier here, which means a bacterial enzyme, most of the time, is a permeas. So this is you already learned. Now specifically for bacteria, this method used by bacteria only for very limited chemicals, which is water, oxygen, and carbon dioxide or some other gas-like chemicals. So basic stuff for this life, they use <coughs> passive diffusion, but not to, op to open. Okay, now the second method, what they're using is called facilitated. Facilitated. Diffusion. Facilitated uh, facil diffusion. It's the same thing as a high diffusion, uh, as, as a passive diffusion. The so nutrient transfer from high to low, and there is no ATP used. So no ATP become ADP and phosphate. However, since you already talk about the facilitated, then you need something, but it needs carrier. This carrier is usually is a permeas. So if we want to draw a curve between passive diffusion and facilitated diffusion, let's say the y-axis is the uh, concentration of the nutrients. And the y-axis is the transfer rate. What are going to be the curve looks like? For passive diffusion, the curve will be pretty much like a line. This is for passive diffusion. For facilitated diffusion, it looks like very steep at the beginning, but later on it will become flat. So this second curve is for facilitated diffusion. Because later on, the protein, the amount of the carrier will be saturated. And it is very similar to your mycolic enzyme curve. By all means say, this facilitated carrier is also permeas, it is an enzyme. 
This is already known. But the key thing here is, for bacteria, the facilitated the diffusion, are they using? They use sometimes, but not often. Not often for bacteria. Why? Because in the real life, most of the time, for bacteria, their nutrients is always very poor outside of their cell membrane system compared to they grow in a bacterial medium. For example, bacteria on the bench, there is a limited nutrition they can use. Maybe some water, some water um, residues, some food residues. Compared to the growth in the bacterial media, there's no tryptophan, no sorbing, no beef extracts. So they cannot use this method to do it. Therefore, this is not very often, very limited for bacteria, but more frequently is in fungi. Okay? In fungi and some of the eukaryotes, it's more important for them to use. So this is a facilitated diffusion. So therefore, it comes out with something we learned and we think it is important for the active transport. So what is active transport? <laughs> Instead of the nutrients going through high to low concentration, it will go opposite way. It's from lower to high concentration. And it needs ATP. So need ATP to hydrolyze become ADP, release phosphates, and it needs carrier, which is a permeus. And uh, in the uh, bacteria microbiology area, people using E. coli as an example find that basically for E. coli, they are using the activate transport. We call it an ABC transport. What means an ABC transporter? The A means ATP. B means binding. And C is means cassette. So it is called ATP binding cassette transport. So how do they do it? We already talked about the fluid molecule model. Phosphate double layer. In the middle, you have a bridge. The bridge-like stuff, it is called the <coughs> interior integral protein. So when we draw, finish draw this double layer, let's say there is some chemicals right here. We call it a solute. And uh, we need a carrier. The carrier is some tall like this. There is a open vessel for you to carry it. Okay, so you're going to go there. And then what happened is this chemical from outside will be released inside to the cell membrane system. At the same time, we need the energy. Where about to be the energy goes? The energy is goes usually is on this side. This is called peripheral Protein. And uh, we also call it ATP binding domain. <coughs> when you see domain here, most of the time, which means a protein. So, happening here is always ATP, hydrolyzed becomes ADP, release phosphates. Same thing on the other side is ATP, becomes ADP, and the release phosphates. So this is what happened for the ABC transport. Did the bacteria use this method or not? Yes, for some of the sugar. But the sugar, we don't 
appear very often. For example, Arvanus, Trahalos. So I will say the ABC transporter is for uncommon, five carbon or six carbon sugar for the bacterial transport. Okay, now, then there's a remaining question. How about the major transport media methods used for the bacteria? And it is very surprising. It is none of these. And you learned all these in your biochemistry class, and you know about these things already. However, for a bacteria, let's say a glucose. Once they transport from the outside cell membrane to inside the cell membrane, they are using a method called group translocation. So how do they do it? This rely on a very special chemical. It is a common chemical, not really special, but for bacteria it is special, called PEP. That's called phosphoenopyruvate. And they need an enzyme, the enzyme name called phosphoenopyruvate transferase. When you see ASE here, which means it's an enzyme. Now how do they do it? So we have to explain to explain to you, okay? So we're gonna draw one right here, and somehow here I'm gonna draw another thing later. So we had a PEP right here. Phosphoenopyruvate. Phosphoenopyruvate will be somehow create a phosphate. This phosphate will be transferred actually to pyruvate. And this process, you know, it will generate energy. There are some residue phosphate comes out. Once this phosphate comes out, they're gonna go a complex. And this complex is called the enzyme complex one. Okay, E1 which means enzyme complex one. So the, and then this phosphate is gonna be released. Then this phosphate will go again, go to another chemical, which is called HPR. What is that? It's a very special chemical called heat stable protein. And it's also going to release a phosphate. Then the phosphate go where? The phosphate is going to find a bacterial cell membrane system. And the bacterial cell membrane system we already talked about is double layer phospholipids right there. We know these things already. However, not only for that, we know there's some protein there. What are those protein? There is a little bit of complex there. Integrated into the double layer system. That's called enzyme complex 2A, enzyme complex 2B, and enzyme complex 2C. So this is what we call enzyme complex ABC. It is a group. Okay? So what they for? If you outside of the cell membrane system, you have a glucose. This is a major sugar bacteria you will use is a glucose. So they go inside how they do it. They go here, they go here. They directly become glucose 6 
phosphate. Somehow, if bacteria have a mannitol, another six carbon sugar. Uh, we will mention that the mannitol salt agar is used by bacteria a lot, especially for staphylococcus. Then they also gonna go inside. Same thing as using this three complex. Then become what? Mannitol, maybe one phosphate. Okay, now the key thing here is where this guy comes from. This you need to know a little bit about chemistry. This comes from glycolysis. Glycolysis. So, what is glycolysis? Uh, the detail we will talk in the examination three. Here we're going to introduce a little bit. Some of you didn't take biochemistry yet. So it is a reaction. A chain reaction. So glucose become glucose six phosphate. Then become fructose six phosphate. Then you become fructose one six five phosphate. This is a six carbon area. Then you become three carbon area. It's a branch, what are they going to be? Glycerohydride three phosphates. <coughs> it's the same thing, okay? So I'll just write it like this. Then go one, three, five, phosphor, glycerohydride. Then become three, phosphor, glycerohydride. Then isomerization become two phosphor glycerate. And then they become a key star. Phosphor enopyrovate. And the last one is pyrovate. This is the key thing here. This is where it comes. Okay? And the bottom line here is pyrovate. And if you learn about chemistry, you know this is an ADP, rely on a phosphate, will become an ATP generator. This phosphate right here could have some residue there, could be used. So, what's the key thing here? If you have a glucose, you come in, with the help of these group chemicals, you directly become glucose 6-phosphate. This will connect it to the glycolysis. You directly go through this one. And then you become phosphoenopyruvate. You recycle it to use it. This is a very smart and economical way for bacteria to survive in their very short time. So we will talk about bacterial growth curve next week. For E. coli, it's only 12 to 18 hours. But they have to survive very well. They need to have a prolific life. Therefore, their energy to use has to be smart. That's the way the story it is. And they, I often tell you that is uh, when you take in the biochemistry class, it certainly helps you, but there's a little bit difference. If you talk about in your biochemistry class, so glucose become glucose 6 phosphates, you need an enzyme, is that right? That's called hexokinase. But that's for fungi, for animal, for human being. For bacteria, they don't use this, this enzyme. They are using this step called group translocation. Okay, that's a key. And the majority of the chemicals, glucose, mannitol, sucrose, they are using this method. So what is group translocation? If we say the very simple, 
which means phosphate transfer with assistance of a group of chemical compounds. And further, will let glucose become glucose 6 phosphate. Or you can say, we'll let common 6 carbon sugar phosphoration. You can say that. Now, why they do this phosphoration? When they carry on that phosphate, they go in some glycolysis, is more efficient. At least they will be skip one step. For the bacteria in their life cycle, it's a very smart reason. Now, what type of the group of chemicals right here? Enzyme complex one, heat stable protein, enzyme complex two, ABC, those are the group of members to help transferring the phosphate. So that's why it's called group translocation. Okay? So that's the story right here. The, now the picture here, you can see clearly what it draw. But I just draw for you, and uh, you will be understanding that the story behind that. It's connected to glycolysis. It's important for some knowledge for the chemicals. Okay? So this is the thing I'll be left. Uh, uh, you guys can take a picture if you want. And uh, that's very good. For, yes? I just want to make sure. With the phenol, the, the phosphoenol pyruvate becomes pyruvate after it gives up its phosphate, right? Yes. Okay. We will talk about glycolysis in examination three again. Okay, when we later, when we later. Because this area usually is we hydrolyze phosphate. So we are using ATP. This is we generate it. In the examination suite, we will talk about all these chemical structure. We will talk about how the ATP generates and how the characteristics. That will be the function of the examination suite. Here, we just want to give you some of the idea of what it looks like. Because otherwise, you will be confusing where the PEP comes from. It is come from right here. And you will be confusing where the pyruvate is right here. So that explains to you the half circle on the picture there. Okay. And you also will be a little bit confusing. Why the glucose become glucose 6-phosphate is a good thing. And you see this line here? It's a very important step, so you can understand that. OK? Good. OK, next the big topic. We will move to talk about the bacterial cell wall structure. And we will talk about the peptidoglycan. That will be the big thing. And also, lipopolysaccharides. And we will talk about that. So I'll remove these off. Because that's a lot of the chemistry. We could describe it to you, and you will be fully understand the peptide of glycan. That's a very important structure for the bacterial cell. Okay, so let's talk about that. So we already did the gram stain. And lots of people enjoy that. So based on the gram stain, well, we already talked about that. The gram-positive bacteria, it is purple color. And the gram-negative bacteria, it is pink. We'll just say that. And we mentioned a very important theory called the cell wall theory, is gram-positive bacteria have a heavy peptidoglycan. And uh, in the opposite, in contrast, gram-negative bacteria have a very thin peptidoglycan. So these are the things we already talked about. Now, now we're going to talk about the peptidoglycan. Okay? So these are the things we already talked about. The cell wall function. And then we're going to move on to this big topic. This slide here has a lot we're going to talk about. So, peptidoglycan, what is it be comp composed of? Said very simple. It is composed by modified sugar 
cross link with amino acid. If we want to say very simple, layman language, let's say I do an extension also with tissue. That will be the easy to understand it. It's a modified sugar combined cross linked with amino acid. Composed by composed for peptide of glycan. But what are the modified sugar? The modified sugar are basically are two, which is NAM. That is N acidal muramic acid and linked with NAG. What is NAG? N acidal glucocyamine. They actually linked with each other. And uh, they linked with each other using one for glycosidic bonds. That's a key thing I will show you. Okay, now they have amino acid right here. What are the amino acid? I use AA. Amino acid could be alanine, could be glutamine, glutamic acids, could be lysine. It could be a little bit complicated, called mesa diamino pound. Palmeric acids. Okay, these are the examples for amino acids. Now the question is, how are they connected with each other? This is something we wanted to explain to you, and you can understand the very well. So that's all the chemicals what I like. So before we know NAG and NAM. We already talked about this is modified sugar. The modified from where? From glucose. So let's go back to your organic chemistry. We need to know a basic glucose structure. Somehow like this. Okay, so let's join. it. What is NAM? Glucose, you have an OH here. We don't have it. 